Eagles Entertainment. With the 15th pick in the NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select. You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Welcome to the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and we've got a fun show with a couple of guests here. Uh, we're going to start things off with Pick 6, where we've got Greg Cosell dropping by to talk through six players at three different positions. We're talking corner, edge rush, and tight end here uh, on this episode. And we're talking through some of the biggest names in this draft, some top 15 potential picks here. Sauce Gardner, Derek Stingley Jr., George Karlaftis. We're going to be breaking down those three and three others here at the very top of the show with Greg Cosell in pick six. After that, draft buzz. Ben Fennell's going to drop by. We're going to talk about the most fun players to talk or to watch uh, here in this class at every single position. Fun conversation, fun exercise, fun players. We're going to do that there uh, in that segment. Also, a mock draft from The Athletic where they've used uh, all of their writers from all around the NFL and and got a sense of where teams are thinking here in the NFL draft. So it's always fun uh, to be able to look at mock drafts like that. We'll do that there in Draft Buzz. Then we'll wrap it up with a couple of great questions here in Draft Mailbag. One on the quarterback position, another uh, on the most talented team of all time, potentially. We'll get into that there on the back end of the show. As always, the best way to hit us up is to go on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify, wherever you listen to the show. Leave us a rating. Leave us a comment. You guys have done a great job at leaving us those comments over the course of the last few weeks, the last couple of months, as we've been getting closer and closer and closer to the 2022 NFL Draft. Keep it up. If you've got a mock draft, we will break it down. If you've got rankings, we'll split them up. Whatever you've got, if you've got a a prospect-specific question, we will answer it here on an upcoming episode. Really appreciate everybody that has taken the time to throw us your support. That said, let's get this one started. Excited to kick things off here with Greg Cosell and Pick 6. Now it's time for Pick 6. All right, excited to welcome back here my friend Greg Cosell from NFL Films. And Greg, uh, we will start here with Cincinnati quarterback Sauce Gardner, uh, a player, three-year starter. Uh, you know, all the, the metrics are all very friendly to Sauce Gardner. He's, he's given up zero touchdowns, according to PFF and other metrics. Uh, when you look at his overall body of work in one of the better defenses in college football, it's tough to walk away not impressed with his game. So I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts on how you project him to the NFL. Yeah, I liked his tape. He was their boundary corner. So there are an awful lot of snaps in which he essentially played zero man coverage because they took their safety, their boundary safety, Brian Cook. And he essentially, uh, when it was a three by one set, let's say, uh, they essentially took Cook, the safety, out of the mix. So Gardner played a lot of what was essentially zero man. Um, And he fits the profile of the long athletic corner. you know, I think that he's he's really aggressive. He's aggravating for receivers. Um, he played a lot of press. I think that's his gig. He's really good at press coverage. Um, he stayed in phase through the route. It, one thing that he did really well is he ran with crossers. Um, he stayed right on the hip of receivers when they ran crossing routes. Um, He played both types of press man well, mirror match press man, where he did not use his hands or his arms, and he also played physical press man. I thought he was really aggressive and competitive, challenging receivers. Um, You know, I I think that he's a guy that's going to line up and play week one as a starting corner in the NFL. To me, I think when we talk about defensive players in particular, we say this about offense as well, but so much of it comes down to uh, scheme and the fit in terms of what, what kind of system is this player going to be plugged into. And to me, the and we have talked about this, the, and it's unique to find players like this that are uh, truly scheme diverse, that have that ability to kind of translate to, to any given scheme. Do you think with Sauce Gardner that he will need to be in a press scheme in order to survive? Or do you feel like he's got some of that versatility that if he went to a team that asked their corners to play with a little bit more depth, uh, that he would be OK? Um, I would think that he'd be at his best in press man. I don't think that he can only play press man, although I will say this. um, I think that he's a, he's a little high cut. He's a little long legged, which at times in off coverage made his movement and change of direction look a little sticky and segmented, not slow, but just not the same as when he was playing press man. Uh, the, The other issue that he has to clean up, no question because of the NFL 
is he tended at times to get a little grabby and handsy versus yep. his quick moves. And certainly we know in the NFL, that's called much more than it is in college football. Um, you know, I, I, you can always nitpick with players, no question. Um, and I really did like his game, but I, I think if you wanted a nitpick, some might say that there was some hip tightness to him. Yep. Uh, and, and, that's, and I feel like that's like the, the one knock that you would have uh, on sauce Gardner. But if you're going to, like you said, uh, if you're going to ask him to come up and be a disruptor early in the down, then if he's got a little bit of hip tightness late in the down, then that won't show up as often yeah. because in theory, if he's going up against the number uh, uh, the, the top receiver in the progression, he's got that ability to take that guy out before the hip tightness becomes Correct. an issue more often than not. Correct. And, and cause it's funny that you asked me that question because I said that, in my final line of transition, I said, well, there's no question he is best suited to be a press man corner at the next level. Gardner can also play in zone concepts like cover three and cover four and would be a great fit in cover two with his physicality jamming receivers off the ball. So I don't think he's specific to press man. I think he does that best. Yep. Yeah, we saw the the interception in zone coverage against Notre Dame, uh, where he was an underneath defender. You, you see yep. some of those show up uh, where he's going to make some plays in zone coverage as well. Uh, let's now take this discussion over to Derek Stingley Jr. from LSU, a guy that was uh, very highly thought of entering this process uh, here in 2021. I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts on him because I know you studied him over the last couple of years as well. Yeah, no, I, I watched a lot of Stingley because you had to go back and watch 2020 and 2019. And obviously 2019, his first year at LSU was the year where he sort of burst onto the scene. Um, there's no question that he's got all the physical and athletic traits that teams look for in outside corners. I mean, he's got size, he's got athleticism, he's fluid, he's sudden, and I think he's competitive. I personally, watching a lot of his tape, didn't buy the idea that he doesn't play hard, but that's just me. Um, I think he's another guy that's at his best playing press man. Um, he can play physical press man. He can play mirror match press. He's certainly got loose hips. He's got easy transition demanded in those techniques. Um, I think one thing that I really looked at carefully, and I forget who told me this a number of years ago, and I've taken note of this every time I watch press corners, is he did have a tendency for his first move, Fran, when he was in press to just go back on his heels a little bit as his first reaction to the receiver. And he was able to compensate for that in college with his recovery burst and speed a large percentage of the time. So the question is, will he compensate for that to the same percentage degree in the NFL? That's, that was just a question I had. Um, I don't think he looked quite as comfortable um, nor as good playing off coverage as he did playing press man. Uh, but I don't think he was poor at it. Um, he certainly has outstanding outside corner traits. There were many, many reps in which you saw those traits. No question. Um, I'll give you an example. I did not think, and I don't know your thought, and I don't know if you remember this guy coming out. I did not think he was quite the same level of prospect as Stefan Gilmore coming out of South Carolina. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I could see I could see that from a from a skill set standpoint. When you look at the, especially the size, once we've got the confirmed measurables there uh, on Stingley, who was listed a little bit bigger than what he came at uh, in Indianapolis. But I think when you look at the their overall skill set, the other big thing that stands out to me uh, with Stingley is his ability to play the ball. Uh, and you will hear yes, him yes. say that yeah. you know the, the ball skills are the lifeblood uh, of playing that position. And, and to me, you know, going back to year one uh, as a true freshman. Uh, the ball skills showed up time and time again uh, in that defense, which always uh, was trying to defend the lead. You know, you're playing on the other side of Joe Burrow and yeah. that offense. Uh, they had they they saw plenty of action there in the secondary, and I thought that he really showed. It. That, and that's the thing that I always kind of go back to is as we continue to, uh, to not you know for all intents and purposes, as we continue to nitpick what we've seen from Stingley over the last couple of years, and some of that is warranted, right? When you talk about the the, la the inability to stay on the field uh, for each of the last two years, but to me, like you go back to that freshman film and this is a guy that just stood out in every way you would want a, a star corner to be able to stand out yeah and you're right I said going back to 2019 tape you see excellent ball production yep. especially in vertical throws outside the numbers yeah no question um and obviously you can't discount that trait because he made I believe six interceptions not all of them came outside the numbers but uh, the large majority did um so no he's a really good prospect uh, you know how it goes. We were led to believe that 
you know, before people got into the process of really watching tape that we'd never seen a corner like Derek Stingley. And, you know, you got to be careful about those kinds of statements. But he obviously, I mean, he's got naturally quick feet. He's got twitch. He's sudden. He's smooth. He's explosive. He has all the traits you would like to see as an outside corner. Yep. I mean, played for three different uh, defensive coordinators in his time at, uh, at LSU, uh, Dave Aranda. Uh, obviously, they had the most success in 2019, but then two different schemes uh, since that point. Now they're at LSU going on their fourth and four years. Uh, but I think when you look at uh, Stingley, especially I- I've had the opportunity to go back and watch some of the practice film with him and Jamar Chase in 2019, him and Justin Jefferson in 2019. And uh, again, just seeing that good on good uh, with yeah. Stingley is just really, really impressive. But um, uh, again, uh, we will see exactly where he goes here in the this draft. Uh, let's get to some of these pass rushers uh, because obviously it's billed as uh, the probably the strength of this class in terms of the top end talent, the overall depth, and, and a couple guys that are being talked about in the middle of round one, towards the latter stages of round one, both coming from the Big Ten. I want to talk to you about George Karloftis from Purdue and then Ar- Arnold Ebicady from Penn State. And we'll start with Karloftis. I'm interested to kind of get your sense of his projection and how you see him best used entering the NFL. Yeah, Karloftis was an interesting evaluation. Um, I watched a lot of him, too, because, you know, I thought he was kind of a, a, a fascinating and at times frustrating player to watch. His game is based much more on effective hand usage and upper body power and strength than higher level athleticism and quickness and flexibility and change of direction. Um, he was certainly powerful. I mean, you're dealing with a guy that I believe was he a shot putter? Uh, yes, he won the Indiana State High School Championship in the shot put when he was, you know, obviously in high school. So he is powerful and efficient with his hands. He could initiate contact. He could play off contact. His hands were calculated. They were strong. I thought his upper body was strong. I thought he had a pass rush plan with his hands. Um, But I thought that his lower body to me, um, you know, he lacked sort of from the waist down, he did not really have the kind of fl- fluidity, f- flexibility that you'd like to see. So there, there were times where um, he made a great move with his upper body, excellent hand usage, but his lower body could not support it and he'd get stuck. He stopped his feet a lot on pass rushes, even when he was successful with his hands and his upper body. And you can't stop your feet in the NFL. Um, I'll tell you who I saw similarities to. Uh, and I know this guy put up huge numbers in college and he's a good NFL player, but I don't think anybody would say he's a dominant pass rusher. He kind of reminds me of Emmanuel Agba. Interesting. Interesting. I, I felt like he had a little bit more juice in terms of just that explosiveness than Agba when he was at Oklahoma state. Um, to me, like I, I look at when, when I look at Carl Loftus, Ultimately, it comes out, yeah, because I, I agree that he does not have that 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 lower body flex that uh, you would look for in terms of that ability to consistently turn the corner. Uh, but then when you look at uh, what he brings from a power element, that as you mentioned, yeah. the ability to kind of get through offensive tackle, go from A to B, uh, right in a straight line uh, through the opposing offensive tackle's chest, uh, but then also the, the effort and the technique. So I think when you pair uh, those three things together, that allows for a guy to, to build. We've seen that uh, time and time again in the NFL is, uh, you know, there's more than one way to, to kind of skin a cat. And I feel like that's going to be the way he'll have to be used uh, moving forward into the NFL. Yeah, because I thought of him at times as well in a sub front as he perhaps going to be moved inside, you know, uh, and and I don't know the answer to that, but that's what I thought. You know, and the reason I mentioned Agba is obviously the way Agba was used by the Dolphins. You know, I thought neither is a pure edge rusher, but both can be deployed in multiple alignments and both play a power game that to me is most effective and can find space. Um, I, I didn't see Carl Loftus as a high level athlete. He does not have sudden explosive movement. At times he looks a little segmented and stiff, um, but he is very strong from the waist up and with his hands and they're calculated. So he certainly has strengths. Um, you know, you think about the Eagles, let's say, and assuming they play the same front that they played a large percentage of the time a year ago, uh, particularly in their base, um, and, and which they probably will, given the signing of Hassan Reddick, um, you think about that that sort of defensive end inside of that linebacker, you know, whether it's a four technique, a four eye, five technique, you know, I think Karloftis could play that role exceptionally well. 
Yeah, and I, I was, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you with so many teams kind of using so, not just multiple fronts, but getting into some of those bare looks, into some of those five man fronts, uh, that, that flexibility yeah. will, will help him from that standpoint, right? No question. No question. See, I see him more like that than as a true wide nine edge rusher. Mm. So then how does he compare uh, to Abikati? How do you view Arnold Abikati's uh, usage moving forward to the NFL? Well, Abikati's a different cat. I yep. mean, he, he's a different player. Um, you know, the thing that struck me about Ebiketti was he looked longer to me on tape than his height. I don't know what, how you felt, but obviously he came in at 6'2 and 3 eighths. And I thought when, when you watched the tape, I felt like he was 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, you know, he just he looked longer to me. Now, he has he has really long arms. And the reason he looked longer to me is I thought his frame was kind of sleek. Like it was, you know, it wasn't, he didn't have a mass kind of frame. He had a sleeker kind of frame. I thought anyway, I don't know your thoughts on that. Um, I thought in the run game, you know, it's easy to say he's not great at the point, but I thought that he snaked and slipped into gaps in the run game. He won as a pass rusher on the high side of the offensive tackle. He's going to need to develop a wider array of pass rush moves and counters. He's going to have to learn how to work the low side, the inside of offensive tackles. But he's got natural athleticism, Fran. He's got flexibility and bend. He can clear the arc and then flatten to the quarterback. Um, I think there's a lot to like with him. Um, he probably begin his career um, as a sub front edge pass rusher. And if it, his career goes as planned, I guess, I think he could be a full-time player, likely on the outside in a 5-2 front. You know, it's funny when you talk about his body type. I mean, he came in just under 6'2 and a half, which is on the shorter side uh, yeah. for pass rushers on the outside. But he came in with over 34-inch arms. Uh, I and know. A lot of a lot of coaches, a lot of scouts will, will like body types like that. Uh, I think back to Aziz Ojolari last year. Uh, people questioned the height, but they loved his length. Uh, I, Carl Lawson uh, was one of those guys, if I remember correctly, where yeah. shorter, uh, but he's got some of that, that length. Uh, that, you know, he's, he, His arms are as long as a guy who is a couple inches taller, right? And so um, Ebi Katie's definitely got one of those body types uh, to be certain. So I, I think that that's interesting. Um, I, I wonder with him, uh, you know, because again, he was not really a full-time player uh, at Temple, Greg. It was really, really interesting. He, he never started until that uh, COVID shorted 2020 season. Um, right, right. He was more of a backup. And then he came in Penn State, started from day one, and was ultra productive uh, out there for the Nittany Lions. I'll, I'll be interested to see uh, you know, what, how he's perceived moving into the NFL. And we'll get a sense, obviously, in just under a month uh, in terms of where he gets drafted and, and how he'll be used. Uh, but you feel like he, he can be that uh, pure edge player uh, in the NFL. I think he can be as yeah. he continues to progress. You know, he was an unranked recruit coming out of high school. No doubt, yep. And, and as you said, he did not play much at all in, at Temple until the 2020 season, which was a shortened season, obviously. Um, but I, I liked his tape. I mean, I, I think there's a lot to like, and there's probably more growth there because he hasn't played a ton of football. But he went against the Big Ten tackles, and he, he had dominant reps against Big Ten tackles high school wide receiver and a high school linebacker. Uh, so again, a guy that wasn't really a full-time pass rusher until he got to North Broad Street, until he got to Temple, uh, took some time to be able to grow into that role uh, and eventually became a starter in his junior year. Um, let's get over to the tight end spot. We, we talked about a couple tight ends already uh, here in this segment, but I want to bring you back to a couple players that uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about. And we'll talk through Greg Dulcich and Charlie Kohler, uh, two guys that were at the senior bowl kind of differing skill sets in terms of what they yes. can bring to the table. And I think Dulcich probably a little bit more dynamic playmaking ability, uh, Kohler, maybe more reliability and consistency, but uh, interesting to kind of get your thoughts on, on how you compare and contrast those two players. And we can start with Dulcich from UCLA. Yeah, I like Dulcich. Um, I think that he's kind of what teams are looking for. I, I don't think he's a, he's a blocker. So yeah, I think you have to put that aside. Um, I think that he's, got build up speed he's got stride length he can run the vertical seams he can run the intermediate and deeper crossers he can line up in multiple locations in the formation he can stretch the field and that's always a trait that's in demand and more so now than ever before in in an era where every coach talks about explosive plays um i think he can probably line up at boundary x as well on the backside of trips um you know, uh, 
I, I liked his tape as a receiver. I think that's what he is. Um, he's a strider. Uh, you know, he caught he caught a lot of seam balls. He gets down the seam. The, the way they used him, I think, tells you what he is because mm. he ran a lot of seam balls. He ran a lot of crossers. Um, and he can work all three levels of the defense effectively. You know who you reminded me of, Greg? I wrote down uh, Tyler Higby uh, when I after I got done watching Dulcich. I got, you know, Higby was a, a fourth round pick coming out of Western Kentucky, uh, former receiver, just like Dulcich, played a little bit in line. And that's where the thing with Dulcich I think is uh, makes him intriguing is that while he is the former receiver uh, and he is athletic, he is dynamic. He's got that three level ability as a pass catcher. The fact that he was used in line, yet he, he had to be able to be used at some point in the run game, playing for Chip Kelly uh, in that run first offense, right? So he was used there. He's not a guy that we're ever going to say is, oh, man, like he's going to be a weapon in the run game. But uh, at least, uh, you know, to, to quote Mike Mayock, you got to lose slowly uh, at the point of attack. I think Dulcich can be that guy while all also offering uh, that pass game value. And if a team views him that way, say, hey, he's not a liability in the run game. Well, now you've got a three down player and a guy that has true versatility at the position. And that will be seen as really valuable. Yeah, no question. Uh, my sense is that he won't be drafted to do that. Um, right. Yep. And, but, you know, depending on who drafts them, you, you know, that depends on on what the offense is, what the team is, the scheme, all those things do factor in. But I don't think he'll be drafted to be an inline blocker. But if if he's seen as a tight end one at some point, he will at least have to do that to some degree. Now, one guy that has been asked to do that, and he's been a high-volume pass target over the course of his career, is Charlie Kohler from Iowa State. Uh, three-year starter, uh, was an All-American for a couple of years, was you know a finalist for the the, uh, the Mackey Award as the top tight end in college football multiple times. Uh, take us through what you've seen from Charlie Kohler uh, and how you see him make that transition to the NFL. Yeah, I really like Charlie Kohler. Um, I watched his tape and actually in 2019, 2020 and this year. So I've seen a lot of Charlie Kohler. And it's funny you mentioned him as a blocker. Um, he he can block. I mean, he, you know, he's probably not the best blocking tight end you'll ever see. But, you know, in that run game, obviously they had Reese Hall. Um, he was featured as a play side blocker from the attached tight end alignment position he competes he executed um he was deployed at times as a rapper in the gap scheme run game um he he blocked multiple blocking concepts so he can block um but where i think he he's really good is as a receiver um look i don't think anybody would say that he's an explosive athlete so if you're just looking at that he probably fran doesn't possess the kind of movement and overall athleticism you would ultimately like to see, you know, you wouldn't say he's Kelsey or Waller, you know, yep. he's not that guy, um, but he's got great hands. He gets open and I know that's cliched, but he catches the ball and he gets open. He's got an intuitive feel for creating needed space to catch it. Um, he's got a great understanding, intuitive, probably instinctive of the pace and tempo of specific routes I wouldn't say he's a clean separator, but he used his body and physicality and hands to create just enough room to make catches. And he did that all the time. Um, you know who I thought he kind of reminded me of? And it's interesting, you know, we're obviously talking. I think the comparison to Zach Ertz is not a bad one. Interesting. Um, and I think Kolar in the NFL will develop into a volume receiver. And I guess that's the thing is when you talk about offensive players and namely the pass catchers, right. Is that uh, it all comes down to opportunity. Like Charlie Kohler. Uh, I mean, he caught 168 balls uh, for Iowa state over the course of his career. He caught over 50 or over 45 passes every year for the last three years, which is huge for a tight end. We don't see tight ends coming out no. with that level of production. And so again, it just comes down to if he had, if he's given that opportunity in the NFL, he has shown that he could, he could be that guy. Uh, now, he did it. He was under three and a half yards after the catch per reception. Uh, not a guy that's going to be viewed as a dynamic playmaker. And, and again, getting back to your comparison uh, to Zach Ertz, that wasn't what Zach Ertz was known for either. Uh, so I, I think that it's kind of interesting when you talk about him. And I would throw, honestly, you put him in, in that same bucket with like Trey McBride, a guy I know that you're really high on. You talked about him here on the show a couple of weeks ago. I think kind of right. similar from that standpoint in that, uh, yeah, they, they contribute in the run game and they can be high volume pass targets. McBride also caught over 160 balls in his career so uh, I think they're both very interesting from that standpoint 
Yeah, I would say McBride's probably a little more naturally athletic yep. than Kolar. But see, to me, Kolar is going to be one of those guys that a quarterback loves, you know, because Kolar, it's like Zach Ertz, okay? You and I both know when Zach Ertz for four or five years put up ridiculous numbers, okay? Um, and and But no one would say Zach Ertz is Travis Kelsey, no matter what the numbers Zach Ertz put up, okay? And Zach Ertz was a great football player in Philadelphia, no question. I think Kolar is going to be one of those guys that a quarterback is going to love. He gets open and he catches the ball and, and he gets open in kind of odd ways. Sometimes like sometimes he'll just run into a, you know, a linebacker and then just snap off a little break and he's open, you know, and I think that he's going to be one of those guys that quarterbacks think of when it's third and six and they need, you know, and, and, and he catches a ball for nine yards and a first down. I think he's going to be one of those kinds of players. Yeah. Uh, and there's something to be said for, again, just that, uh, that reliability. And again, th- people wouldn't think of Charlie Kohler as, oh, he's really versatile. People would think of Dulcich or Isaiah Likely or any of these guys as more versatile. But to me, right. the versatility is that ability to be on the field for all three downs and to be used in a number of different ways. And uh, Kohler checks those boxes. Without question. I, he's a guy that I think you got to watch a lot of tape. That's the way I felt. And he grows on you because yeah. he's not dynamic, explosive, sudden. He's none of that stuff where you go, oh, my God, look at Charlie Kolar. Right. But you just keep watching him, and he just he's available all the time, and he catches the ball. Sure. No, he's a, a really talented player uh, and a guy that we will continue to talk about here in the run-up to the NFL Draft. Greg, thank you so much, as always, for joining us here for Pick 6 on the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. We will talk to you again next week. All right, Fran, thanks. Eagles fans, Merrill Reese here to tell you about the Eagles Autism Challenge presented by Lincoln Financial Group. This annual Ride, Run, Walk event supports autism research and programming as we work hard every day to advance the conversation from awareness to action. This year's event will take place on Saturday, May 21st at Lincoln Financial Field. With your support, we can help transform the lives of individuals affected by autism. Register today at eaglesautismchallenge.org. Now it's time for Draft Buzz. All right, let's have some fun here for Draft Buzz as we welcome in Ben Fennell. And Ben, uh, I say that because the the first thing I want to hit you on before we get into our mock draft that we're going to cover here for our mock draft roundup, the most fun tapes to watch at each position. We go through a ton of film all year round on these college prospects. And there are some guys that are you know a little bit of a drag to be able to watch. It's a little bit of a slug to get through. Then there are other guys that are just fun to be able to watch. And you finish three, four games, and you're like, man, I, w- I want to watch another one. And so uh, I would kind of want to hit you on who are the most fun players to watch at each position. I am limiting you. I am saying one player each because I know you. You're going to give three or four names. No, we're not doing any of that. We're doing <laughs> one name at each. You're going to give one. I'm going to give one. And then we're going to move on. We're going to get in. We're going to get out. So uh, we'll start a quarterback for you the most fun quarterback that you've had fun studying uh, so far in this draft cycle. And this is going to be for lack of better words, a fun conversation because this can mean so many different things to each of us for each player. It could be fun for the system they play in or fun for how he plays or fun for an aesthetic of, you know, the way he looks. So let's start off with quarterback here. The most fun quarterback to watch the study, to sit on your couch, this class has got to be Matt Corral. Yep. At uh, Ole Miss, who I feel like, you know, they say no two golf shots are the same. Well, no two throws of his are the same. I feel like everything is extremely creative with his arm angles, his off platform throws, his throws on the move. He is the least robotic quarterback in this class. Very reminiscent of the way we studied Zach Wilson last year. All sorts of creativity and how he gets the job done on a down to down basis. Sometimes it's a little reckless. Sometimes it's a little erratic. When it's clean, though. It is pretty, and it is a lot of fun to watch. Very whippy release, very quick decisions, quick twitch movements. Matt Corral has a lot of fun throws on his tape. So you have no idea who I'm going to bring up in each of these. So what I did was I wrote down two names, and if you picked one of them, then I was going to go with the other. One of the names I wrote down was Matt Corral. Uh, okay. That it's just like – the, the 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 more you watch, you're like, man, like I don't, I just don't know. And then you, but you're like, I can't quit this guy. He's just, he's a lot of fun to be able to watch for a lot of the reasons you said. Uh, the offense is obviously a lot of fun to watch, right? It's a, a highly schemed offense. It's like everything is either screen RPO 
or it's a well-defined shot play that's really well schemed up uh, against the coverage and he's willing to cut it loose. He's just a really tough player. Uh, so you get the athleticism, you get the toughness, uh, you get the arm talent. Matt Corral's a really fun player. Now, uh, for me, I, like I said, I wrote down two names. I wrote down Corral. I also wrote down Malik Willis. And you're going to get the, all the, the wide variants here of play with Malik Willis. But no matter what's happening, it is pretty fun to watch, right? Because uh, the guy's got a, a rare arm, uh, his ability to drive the football. I remember the first time I talked about him here on the podcast, uh, this was last year, uh, it showed up because of like a 55-yard bomb he threw. He striped a, a deep post uh, over the top for a big play and a touchdown, right? So you see uh, that dynamic athleticism. You see the unique arm talent. Uh, and you look, uh, is it always within structure and always the prettiest? No, but again, the, the, the fun along the way uh, makes it a big part of it. So Malik Willis uh, was the guy that I will go through here uh, for the quarterback. And fun quarterbacks, Fran, just want to mention six other guys real fast yeah. here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, I, have, I put it like, it literally, clean, I literally emailed you in all caps, in bold, with three exclamation points, one name each. So uh, we're going to hold you to that here for this one. I figured uh, that was a typo, not emphasis. All right? Yeah, so right. I, I, never, exactly. I never know what that means. Oh, let's go to a uh, running back. Who, who's the most fun running back for you? Well, I want the guy that can shake you, that can melt you, and maybe even occasionally hurdle you. And that's Hassan Haskins, Ooh. who I think has a lot of different ways in how he gets his production in the run game. And any run in Michigan, he may just take the dirty yards and want to finish you. And as Marshawn says, run through a defender's face type of finish. But then he can shake you in the open field with some sudden, sharp-footed movements. He's not really that loose. He'll give you one firm cut, uh, but he does it very suddenly. And then that's surprising every now and then. He'll just go over the top of a guy going low up. After he's kind of run through a guy's face a few times and they start going low at the ankles, he'll go right over the top on you at full speed. So Hassan Haskins has a lot of fun ways in the way he got production at Michigan, even a couple entertaining stiff arms in there as well. Well, he'll finish a defender uh, with his hand uh, plant to the ground. So uh, Hassan Haskins, Michigan, fun tape. All right. So Hassan Haskins, not one of the two names that I wrote down. I wrote down Damian Pierce from Florida, uh, who probably okay. had the most fun play with that touchdown run that got called back against Florida State with a helmet popped oh, out yeah. at the five-yard line. But I'm actually going to go Kyron Williams, the second name I wrote down. And the reason why is that – He's the most fun running back to watch in pass protection because he's just so damn good as a blocker. Uh, the way he's able to see uh, to be able to read defenses, uh, he's always in the right spot. He's really, really aggressive. He's stout. He you would tell that he enjoys that part of the game. So uh, for me, Kyron Williams, and also as a ball carrier, as a pass catcher, uh, he just does a lot. And you know his play personality pops off the film. So Kyron Williams, the most fun running back uh, for me to study on tape. Let's go to wide receiver. Uh, who's your guy here? Oh, man, there's so many guys to do in this class. Uh, and just thinking of playmakers in the receiving category around college football, I'm going to go with the way off the grid here. one, And that's Khalil Pimpleton out of Central Michigan, who's all of 5'9", 175. This guy does everything. He does kick returning, punt returning. He does vertical shot plays in the offense, yards after catch stuff, even a bunch of wildcat quarterback. Uh, snaps where he's throwing the ball as well. Tons of rushing attempts. He's one of the loosest, most creative, most explosive playmakers with the ball in his hands. Just watch his 20 plus yard, uh, you know, plays in his college career. Tons of fun plays on the tape for Khalil Pimpleton. He's small. He is electric though. Watch his pro day workout. He actually went outside while it was snowing and caught punts and he caught some with one hand while he had balls in the other hand. He seems like a guy that coaches are going to want in their locker room, filling out the back end of their roster, probably a priority free agent, but on a rainy day, you want some fun tape, Khalil Pimpleton, find his highlights out there. He is a lot of fun. See, like th these are the names that I was going to you for because, you know, I have not done Cleo Pimpleton. Uh, I don't even know if he's in my sheet. I'm really glad you brought him up. I don't know if I'm going to get to him before next month, but still glad that uh, you were able to bring him here to the podcast. Uh, I will go with more of the low hanging fruit. You're going to go with a, a priority free agent type player. Let's go with a potential first round pick, a likely first round pick for our longtime listeners of the show. People that hung with us all throughout the college football season every single week. We were talking about Traylon Burks, and the reason why is that it's first of all, it's a where's Waldo every single play, trying to see where he is in the formation. Is he out wide? Is he in the slot? Is he lined up as in a wing? Is he in the backfield? Is he a wildcat? All the different ways that he can be used, he was. And then you look at all the different ways he can win. He's going to run by you. He's going to run through you. He's going to carry the football. He's going to get it on gadgets. He's going to get it on screens, on over routes, on fades, all the above. So to me, like watching Traylon Burks and all the ways that he was able to win, create big plays. He was our one play takeaway, a handful of times uh here this fall on a weekly basis with 
with me, you, and Dane. Uh, Traylon Burks, just uh, so much fun to watch. Who cares about the 40 time? I, I want to be able to see uh, what this guy does on a football field. And he was just a joy to watch on a weekly basis. And then getting back and studying the film, uh, just so much fun to be able to study. So Traylon Burks, uh, my guy here in terms of the most fun tape to be able to go through at wide receiver. Let's now transition to tight end. Who's your guy here? Well, this has to be Jelani Woods. And every step of the way, it was fun. Because at 6'7", 250, he was a high school quarterback. Go find that tape to watch some fun action on the field. A huge quarterback, goes to Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, move him to tight end. Well, they don't feature him, uh, the tight end, in Mike Gundy's offense. So he all he had to do was block. But he got after it. So he's got some really entertaining plays in the run game and pass protection. Just watch some of their play-action shot plays. He's very often blocking defensive ends one-on-one. I think that's a lot of fun to watch. I'm kind of a sicko, though, for inline wide tight ends out there. Transfers to Virginia. And then you get to watch this big moose in the pass game, shielding out smaller defensive backs on seams and in-breakers. Really, really interesting after the catch because no one can drag him down. He's so big. Really reminds me of Mercedes Lewis or maybe even like a Leonard Polk or a Crockett Gilmore as a throwback. He's a lot of fun. He'll run down on special teams, does some personal protecting as well. Jelani Woods has turned some heads and caught some eyes at the combine in his pro day workout. His tape is just as interesting and just as fun. So Jelani Woods, Virginia via Oklahoma State, most fun tight end on tape. You know, when I woke up this morning, I rolled out of bed and I was just kind of getting the grips of what was going to happen today. I did not think I would hear Leonard Pope's name uh, mentioned. And so I'm glad that you were able to bring me that joy uh, here on this Wednesday <laughs> afternoon. Uh, for me, you mentioned uh, lo- loving the Y tight ends. And so I almost went with Kate Otten because he's just so much fun to watch at the point of attack as a blocker. But I'm going to go almost the other way here. I'm going to go with Isaiah Likely. And the reason why I'm going to say Isaiah Likely uh, is his usage. He's moved all over the place. um, But I love the scheme there at Coastal Carolina, all the different things that they do uh, with moving him around the formation, getting him in space. They do a great job of attacking all the different coverages that they face. uh, And he's got that athleticism to be used at all three levels of the field, right? So you see the creativity there. But then we've talked about his creativity as a blocker as well. He's not the, you know, put your foot in the ground, put your hand in the ground, line him up next to tackle, and he's going to block a defense van with base blocks that's not Isaiah likely but what you will see is when they run the little end arounds and you see him kind of uh, coming around as the as the lead blocker on an arc release or uh, you see him up at the second level on the a little screen pass to the running back and now all of a sudden he's there uh, to ear hole a linebacker right you see all the different ways that he's used as a blocker he does that on the move so he's just a really fun tape to be able to bring in because of his usage and the, sch- the scheme down there uh, with the chance so uh, I will go Isaiah likely there let's go to the offensive line offensive tackle uh who's your guy it's got to be tyler smith and it's purely fun because he is looking to dump defenders every chance he gets listen he plays with wide hands he has a nasty mentality converting from that defensive line spot a lot of penalties because of that a lot of holds because he's really trying to grip torque and dump and finish guys and break their will and he gets them quite often and it is a lot of fun to watch him stress and strain late in the down to the echo of the echo of the whistle trying to really put those defenders on their back and break their will. So Tyler Smith, a lot to clean up on his tape, technique-wise, discipline-wise. But when he's on and he's finishing, his tape is a lot of fun. One of two names I wrote down. The other uh, was Iki Aquanu for that reason, right? No I mean, question. Aquanu yeah. is just like, he is a joy. Like, all right, I've got I've got 15 minutes left in the office. You know, let me just let me just put on a, a one NC State film and just run through the runs real quick, uh, just to watch him getting after people. <laughs> he, he is just a, so much fun to be able to study on tape. Let's it's a feel it's a feel good watch. You know, it every day, now and then I wake up on the wrong side of the bed and I'll always have my go to tapes. You know, I watch some uh, the office outtakes or things like that. <laughs> Iki Aquanu tape him finishing. That just puts you in a good mood, sets you on the right path for the day. Yeah, when you when you see uh, uh, Kelly Kapoor yell at Dwight and call him, you know, shut up, beat farmer. That's the same, the same kind of <laughs> feeling you get from uh, uh, from watching Iki Aquano. Let's go to uh, offensive guard. Uh, who's your pick here for this one? I'm going to keep going off the grid here because we're just talking fun. So a guy that I loved watching his tape, and I've actually loved watching this offense for a number of years, put on San Diego State. They get after it in the run game. They have for a number of years, going back to Rashad Penny and Danelle Pumphrey, our old good friend, bunch of maulers in the offensive line. William Dunkel, good old Bill Dunkel there. He looks like a refrigerator wearing cleats, but he is an absolute snowplow. He will mow you down if you're in his tracks. Now, if you take a step to the left or to the right, he's probably not getting you. But if you're on the tracks, 
you're getting plowed. And they like to run the football out there. Watch his tape against Utah, against Arizona. He's even got a couple penalties late after the play, a little downfield. He's looking to, you know, get defenders around the pile as well. William Dunkel, 6'5", 330. He gets after it in the run game. Put on that San Diego State offense. You know, you have uh, Cam Thomas's brother, Zach Thomas, playing tackle. Greg Bell at running back. A couple of guys are at the combine, including William Dunkel. Really fun tape. Uh, I'm going to stay at the uh, the mid-major level. I'm going to go with Cole Strange, uh, actually from Tennessee nice. Chattanooga. Uh, and Cole Strange, the, the two things that stand out, and this is what, what, what can make offensive line film really fun to be able to study, athleticism and ferocity on contact. And that's Cole Strange all day. <laughs> he's trying to finish you. He's trying to get you on your back. Uh, and he's really athletic. So you see him out in the move. You see him on the screens, uh, you know, playing at offensive guard. He's a joy to be able to study. And then when you see him go down to the senior bowl and do what he did down there uh, in terms of just kind of honing that in and being a little bit more find a little bit more consistent now all of a sudden you get excited about him as a prospect but even uh watch him as more of a developmental player early in his career like man this guy's just fun uh to be able to watch so uh let's now go to uh center uh, who's your center here i'm gonna go with uh alec lindstrom center out of boston college younger brother chris lindstrom and this guy is a nasty mauler in the run game he looks to finish guys he'll go get you if you're on the ground just sitting there as well we saw him in kind of a pro style scheme uh, under the coach that went to Colorado State. That's blanking uh, my brain right now. But then Adazio. converted Adazio. But with the new scheme and Jeff Halfley coming from Ohio State, much more of a spread concept. You get to see him in space a ton on screens and getting the ball to Zay Flowers on the perimeter and leaking out offensive linemen. He loves to find smaller defensive backs and just walk them off the field. Alec Lindstrom has a mean streak to him. And I love those guys, Fran. Those are the guys that make me sit up in my chair and uh, maybe get an extra star in the report or two. Alec Lindstrom likes to finish defenders, and he's a crush of mine. Yeah, and for me, like Cam Jurgens, uh, the center from Nebraska, yeah. uh, really kind of fits that bill as well. And this guy is a weapon out in space. And there are there are only a handful of offensive linemen that you would look at and say that they can be that way, uh, used that way when they get to the NFL. Jurgens is one of those guys. And so just seeing him out in the move, uh, you you don't want to make this comparison because it's to an all-time great, but to say like he looks like Kelsey in terms of out in space and what he does, uh, the angry ballerina stuff that we've talked about and we love so much uh, with him on film. Jurgens brings a little bit of that uh, to his game. Cam Jurgens, that's a great pick. He's got a little nasty as well, too, which borderlines some yep. penalties post-play and things like that. One little side note asterisk as we're putting the offense to bed, Zion Johnson, Davidson film. Yeah, that was an okay. offense that flipped their tackles based on strength and weakness. And Zion Johnson at Davidson, yeah, he would murder someone on the right side. And then go to the left side next play and murder a guy over there and keep flipping back and forth all game. I think Louisville did a little bit with Lamar Jackson, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, correct. But that's just one little extra throw in there. Zion Johnson, his Davidson tape before he went to Boston College. Yeah, the tackle uh, that Washington took in the third round, uh, he would see – oh, trying to – I'm misremember. I can't remember his name. Um, but uh, – that he would in in game you would see him move from left to right left to right he's he's off Washington yeah. now he's off so he's on someone else's team I forget exactly where but um, all right let's go to the defensive side pass rusher edge rusher who do you like here who's your uh, most fun tape to watch I'm gonna go with Kingsley Anabare ooh because this guy just plays with his hair on fire I don't know if he has a pass rush move in the bag but he's got length he's got motor and he's got will and that's why it reminds me so much of like a Brian Arakpo or like Emmanuel Agba where they're just strong. And they just go. And that's kind of their game. And Anabare has some really fun plays, chasing quarterbacks all over the field, playing 100 miles an hour, leaving his feet to go full extension at quarterbacks. Listen, sometimes he's a, he completely misses these guys. But he just plays completely balls to the wall, hair on fire. So Kingsley Anabare, when you get him naked and just watch him one-on-one at the Senior Bowl, it's really not his game kind of thing. You need him to play with that effort, that motor, and be a complete football player. So when you're just watching him isolated, it's really not, you know, he's not going to wow you. But this guy plays so hard. He's got a lot of fun tape. Yeah, we're on the same page here when it gets to defensive front seven guys. It's just like, uh, where is just the, the, the violence, right? Where are the guys where you're just, they're so explosive. They play with high effort uh, and then they arrive and it's just a high speed collision uh, at the point of contact. For me, Alex Wright from UAB, uh, you're, you're talking about a guy who's 6'6", uh, 260 plus, 270 plus pounds who can run in the four fives. And you just see that speed and that ability to close on film. And you're like, man, like he just arrives with such ferocity. Uh, it's just those kind of guys, 
are so much fun to be able to watch because there, there's there, you'll be watching you lean back in your chair and that play comes up you're like oh you just stand up you're like all right I, I, let's go like, let's <laughs> wait for that uh that next one to pop up alex wright has a bunch of those uh on tape making really fun to study uh how about you for defensive tackle defensive tackle i think i have the pick here for both of us not big jordan davis of course not big jordan davis big noah ellis out of oh. idaho this kid's 6'5", 360, and plays in a track stance. He shoots across the line of scrimmage in 360 with a good first step. He overwhelms interior offensive linemen and immediately puts them on scapes. He blows up offensive blocking schemes. Like, he'll take the guard, the center, the fullback, everybody with him and just ruin the play. I don't even think he touched the ball carrier. His tape is hilarious because he is just massive and occasionally – the level of competition is a mismatch, and it shows on tape. I put out a strand of plays from Idaho, find my tweet, of putting five or six plays of him just blowing up backfields. Noah Ellis is a lot of fun and a monster size uh, defensive tackle. As you started that, you, you started saying, uh, you know, not Jordan Davis. And I thought for sure you were going to go with my pick. Uh, and you, did, you ended up not going my way. I'm going to go with Perry and Winfrey because – there are just huge bone crushing hits because he's so explosive yes. and he's so violent. Uh, like go back to last year as a junior, they show up. And then this year it was like game after game after game. You're like, Oh my God, like this guy is such a wrecking ball. And then we see it down at the senior ball and him doing it, carrying that with them uh, to mobile. He's just one of those guys. Like he is just so, even if like, it's like you were talking about earlier with any bar, like, does it always like look pretty? Is it always like technically sound? You're like, Oh, like this guy has a real plan. Like, no, it's not that way with Winfrey all the time, but this guy just wakes up starving for violence. And that's kind of what Winfrey <laughs> like brings to the table. Uh, he's just so much fun to be able to watch. I just landed on a good comp for Winfrey and it's hard because he's played a little bit out of position. You have to project a little bit. Okay. But as I'm watching his tape and kind of figuring out where I want to use him and what he does, but he reminds me a lot of Muhammad Wilkerson coming mm -hmm. out of temple to the jets Kind of a guy that can play up and down the line, clearly an oversized end, but a guy with a lot of juice between the tackles. And anyone that's wondering, you know, what does Winfrey do? Put on 2020 Texas and watch the first two plays of the game. The guy is just a magnet to the ball. He'll flow outside the numbers, doesn't get there the first play. The next play, he runs 20 yards down the field and forces a fumble. That's what you're getting with Perry yep. and Winfrey, another guy that just plays very hard with exceptional effort. All right, what do you got for linebacker? Linebacker, I got to go at Leo Chanel because this guy is just a landing strip downhill. This guy just wants to plug into the B and the A gaps, smash offensive linemen, hold up gaps. And at 255 or 260 or whatever he played at as an off-ball linebacker, he was able to bang with some offensive linemen. That's why some people are giving him the kind of Van Der Esch comparison because Van Der Esch would play downhill at Boise and post up guards in the run game and hold gaps. And that was Chanel. So it's a little bit of like – you know, we think of some Patriot scheme guys like Hightower or even Brandon Spikes, the guys that just say go and go downhill at our battering rams. That's Leo Chanel. So he can make some offensive linemen look really bad at times with his explosiveness and just coming downhill at them in the run game with some of those run blitzes. Really good blitzer in general. Really good speed. Good athlete. Strong player. His tape's a lot of fun. Yeah, we talked about Chanel this week in our linebacker preview. Make sure you go check that out if you haven't already listened to that on the feed. And we also talked plenty about Montana State linebacker Troy Anderson uh, in that discussion. And Anderson, he's just a lot of fun to watch, too, because uh, you're talking about a pure height, weight, speed project. Uh, this was the first year where he was not playing both ways. And that's what I would say to go and do as well. I mean, he set school records, and I'm pretty sure big sky records, with rushing touchdowns as an offensive player as a sophomore. Right? You see, you know, just, you just go back and just watch. Let me just watch his carries from when he was on offense and you just see a guy who was just a wrecking ball and again uh at that size uh to be able to move the way he does he's just a really really unique player and if he could put it all together uh you could have a, a true three down player moving forward into the nfl let's go now to uh the secondary and we'll go to corner uh who's your corner that was uh too much fun to be able to watch i'm gonna go with a guy that i think i'm way too high on because i just keep checking every box i need to from him. i thought he wasn't going to test well checks a lot of boxes there I think you think who I'm going to be talking about here, but I'm not. Cam Taylor Britt out of Nebraska. His tape is a lot of fun. He ragdolls receivers out there in the run game. He wakes up and chooses violence. He's one of those corners that just wants to beat a receiver's face in, walk him off the field, turn back around, and throw his body into a running back or a bubble screen or something like that. Throws his body around quite a bit. Really tough. 
This kid's got ball skills as well. Some of the prettiest zone savvy interceptions I think I've studied in the last five years. Somewhere he can kind of sink over number one and still play the seam over number two or vice versa. Cam Taylor Britt at Nebraska, I thought was going to be a four, five, five guy. I thought maybe more of a cover two corner. He tested out of this world. Yep. I think he's a top 50 player all day long. I think right in that end of round two, early round three would be a nice landing spot for Cam Taylor Britt. Tough corner out there, good ball skills, fun player to watch. So for a guy that was really experienced uh, in the senior class, goes to the senior bowl to a guy that really only has one true season of starting experience in the SEC or in the ACC, uh, a true junior. Let's go to Clemson's Andrew Booth. And to me, when I'm watching mm-hmm. corners, the thing that most that makes those guys the most fun, if they've got plus ball skills and if they're really competitive, forceful tacklers downhill. And Andrew Booth is both of those uh, in a big package. So you watch him play the ball. You see that one-handed interception against, was it Virginia or Virginia Tech last year as a as a sophomore? That really kind of put him on the national radar. Then you watch him come downhill, and uh, he lives on that island where screens and bubble screens, gadgets, they all go to die uh, on the island that Andrew Booth lives at. I think when you look at his ability to come downhill and finish, he's really ferocious on contact. He's really violent. Uh, but then also that ability to play the ball in the air, that's what makes Andrew Andrew Booth, such a fun player uh, to be able to study. Let's now go to uh, safety. Who's your pick here for safety? Last one. Now, I really struggled with this one, Fran, because there's a lot of different ways to yes. go here with a rangy guy, a thumper, a versatile guy, you know, an undersized spark plug. And I really didn't know who to go with here. I'm still kind of scanning my board as I want to lock someone in. You know what? Let's go with a Cincinnati Bearcat. Brian Cook, nice, one of the most surest tacklers out there, but he'll dump you as well. He loves the roll tackle where he kind of grabs you around the waist, spins his body, but will plant you as well. He has some highlight tackles where he just melts ball carriers in a very technically sound form. He plays with his hair on fire as well. Great in run support, good range on the back end. They see him being a kind of an early day three pick at this point right now in the safety pecking order. But Brian Cook, don't forget about this kid. Really productive player, tough safety, and his tape is a lot of fun on that defense. I am shocked that you didn't pick Jalen Petrie because that, that was the first thing I was thinking I wrote about down. it. I was uh, thinking. I, I know. I know you're a big Petrie fan, and to me, it goes back to like the. Um, uh, the conversation uh, about Traylon Burks, where it's like the where's Waldo with Petrie. Is he going to be uh, stacked? Is he off the ball? Is he in the slot? Is he going to be playing from depth? And uh, when you look at the way that he's used, the way that he plays, he plays a million miles an hour. Uh, he's really, really competitive in everything that he's asked to do in that defense. He'll blitz. He'll defend the run. He'll play man to man. He'll play in underneath zone. He can be a ball hawk. So I, I think when you look at Petrie, all the different things he's asked to do and the way that he plays, uh, to me, that's just a combination for what it equals a really, really fun player. So, uh, yeah, just kind of a, a fun exercise to just go through. And who are the guys that really stick with us in terms of being really fun to be able to study on tape? So uh, I'm glad you're able to humor me uh, there for that. Now, uh, real quick, let's wrap this up with our mock draft roundup. And, and we're going to pick a mock draft every single week. This week, we're going over to The Athletic, where they did a staff mock draft. They utilized all of their writers around the entire NFL. And one of the things I love about the exercises like this, you know, ESPN will do things like this uh, at times, obviously using up the, the, the uh, ESPN Nation uh, reporters. You're utilizing voices that are very, very in tune with what each team is thinking and their strategy and uh, you know what they need, right? So uh, it's not just one person doing this mock draft. It's up to 32 people doing this mock draft. And so for me, I love articles like this. I love content like this because you really get the expertise from all around the league. And uh, that's why I wanted to kind of bring this one to the table. We'll start. We're going to go through the entire first round uh, with some big takeaways, but we'll start with these Eagles picks, which were made locally uh, by Bo Wolf and by Zach Berman uh, with The Athletic. And real quick, 15th overall pick, uh, Bo Wolf has the Eagles selecting Purdue pass rusher George Karlaftis. We talked about him in the last segment with Greg. Here is the blurb from Bo. Uh, The signing of Hassan Reddick should help a pass rush that finished 31st in sack rate in 2021, but the Eagles still need long-term help at defensive end. Pair that with Howie Roseman's long-displayed team-building philosophy of building through the trenches, and it's easy to understand why it feels a a fate accompli. Of course, Bo's got to throw that one in there. A fate accompli that the Eagles will draft an edge player with at least one of these first-round picks. Karlaftis is the best one left on the board, 
and would provide an interesting contrast of styles with Josh Sweat. At six foot four, 266 pounds, he's more strong than Bendy, but even after a relatively uninspiring four and a half sack season as a junior, he's young and should theoretically have a high floor for a team with only 34 year old Brandon Graham and 2021 sixth round pick Teron Jackson at defensive end alongside Sweat and Reddick. That is just fine. So, uh, Ben, I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts here uh, on Carl Aftis. Again, we talked about him earlier with Greg. He discussed his ability to kind of kick inside potentially in some of these multiple fronts, which uh, we see here with this Eagles defense. Uh, what do you think about Carl Aftis, his ability to kind of play multiple roles uh, up front for a defensive line? Yeah, I think that would be an exciting pick for Jonathan Gannon in this Eagles front. I think he can, he's a guy that can play in space, I think, a little bit more than uh, his body type would suggest. I think he has really good athleticism to whether he wants to kick out in a Sam roll in space or kick back inside to like a three tech roll as well. I think he has a lot more versatility and positional versatility than maybe you would think. Uh, at 6'5", 270, or whatever he measured in at. But he's a power player. He's a three-down player, very stout at the point of attack, with a lot of ways to then get upfield and get after the quarterback. And he's a really great fit and kind of a coincidental fit in that we had former Purdue Boilermaker Ryan Kerrigan here, you know, for a cup of coffee. And while he's towards the backside of his career, a lot of people see similarities with the way he came out of Purdue and George Carl left his career at Purdue and the way they win. So I see you're just getting a souped up younger version of the Ryan Kerrigan we had here, which if a lot of Eagles fans remember played inside quite a bit last year, maybe not the most productive at that point in his career and the way he was used. But I think Carl Laftis will be the souped up younger version of that exact player that was on our front last year. Interesting. Yeah. I think that when you look at his usage, he's got that flexibility and that will certainly help his value moving forward into the NFL. Let's get to the next pick here. 16th overall. This once again uh, comes from Bo, the selection, Georgia defensive tackle Jordan Davis. And here's the blurb uh, from Mr. Wolf. The Eagles would love to maneuver around the board a bit, but there are no takers in this exercise. So they stick with Roseman's bread and butter. Roseman has made 10 first round draft picks during his tenure as general manager, and he has never deviated from the positions he prioritizes most quarterback, wide receiver, O line, and D line. With three picks this year, maybe that will finally change, but not with someone like Davis, who presents the kind of upside that seems unrealistic on the board. Uh, at six foot six, 341 pounds, Davis ran a 478 second uh, 40 yard dash with a 99th percentile broad jump. The question is whether he'll be able to do more than stop the run at the next level. With the Eagles, he would rotate initially with Fletcher Cox, Javon Hargrave, and promising second year player Milton Williams. Until Cox leaves next offseason, that's a scary group of defensive tackles, as you'll find, aside from Georgia at least. So, Ben, uh, I know you're high on Davis, and we haven't talked too much, to be honest, in this segment about the possibility of him ending up here in Philadelphia. He, he's not often uh, mocked to the Eagles, surprisingly. So what do you think about Jordan Davis, his fit uh, in this scheme from what you saw in Jonathan Gannon in year one? Yeah, I think Jordan Davis is a uh, a great fit for Jonathan Gannon's single gap kind of upfield scheme. And I see him much more as a disruptor than a run plugging nose tackle that's going to sit there and uh, you know, be a line of scrimmage dweller and two gap and kind of keep linebackers free. I think he's going to be the playmaker up front, along with Fletcher Cox and a lot of those other defensive linemen and Milton Williams and now George Carl Aptis ahead of him. Remember, Milton Williams is a ball clay as well. It can play up and down the line. So adding him, Jordan Davis, Carl Aptis already to the Barnett and Brandon Grams and Josh Sweats of the world. I see a lot of versatility, a lot of disruptors, a lot of three down players out there. I just see a lot of different ways to attack opposing offenses, blocking schemes, protection schemes. So Jordan Davis, I've completely come full circle around on. This is not a nose tackle. This is a disruptive single gap defensive tackle that I think can play one tech, three tech. We've seen him play defensive end for Kirby Smart. So he's a guy whose athleticism is clearly freakish and you know tough to find as far as human beings. And I think he's going to be a lot of fun and very disruptive for this Eagles front. Yeah, as we've talked about numerous times here across so many different positions, it's not about what you were asked to do in college. Uh, it's what you can do in the NFL. And just because you weren't asked to do something in college doesn't mean you can't do it moving forward. So uh, I think that will be interesting to talk about here with Davis transitioning to the NFL. Let's get to the 19th pick, the third pick in the first round for the Eagles. This one comes from Zach Berman. And the pick is Arkansas wide receiver Traylon Burke. So let's get to this, uh, this, this blurb here from Zach. A wide receiver for the third year in a row. The Eagles have a need at the position still. 
still, and this would represent good value. Burke's combine testing won't be the reason he's a first round pick, but it's hard to argue with standout production in the SEC uh, and the size and versatility to be used around the formation. Comparisons to Debo Samuel and A.J. Brown might be ambitious. A linebacker like Devin Lloyd and Kobe Dean or a cornerback like Andrew Booth could also be sensible options based on how the board has fallen. And it's hard to ignore Kenny Pickett's presence with the Eagles on the clock. Philadelphia would also hope a trade market generates for one of its picks. Regardless, Burks would be a good outcome for a team that still needs weapons on offense. So uh, I'm going to be honest, Ben, we've uh, we've talked a lot about Traylon Burks and his potential to land here in Philadelphia. Uh, it's almost like a weekly basis where he is mocked uh, to the Eagles in this segment. So I don't have a lot more to, a lot more to add. Uh, I don't know if you do, but I was just chatting with uh, Melissa Kelly, our talented producer here uh, with Eagles Entertainment. She's in charge of producing Eagles Draft Central, which uh, that's going to be myself, uh, uh, Gabriella DiGiovanni, Ross Tucker, breaking down uh, everything draft weekend. And we were just talking through the draft and say, look, the Eagles are not just it's not just about three first round picks. But they're the first team since 2000, Ben, to have three picks, not just in the first round again, but in the top 20. Just a rare opportunity to acquire blue chip talent. The last team to have that was the New York Jets in 2000 when they took uh, in the top 20. Both uh, they took Sean Ellis, John Abraham, and Chad Pennington. So uh, a really unique opportunity to, to acquire blue chip talent. Three picks in the top 20. Yeah, I think it's really exciting. And just uh, my two cents on the Traylon Burks pick there. I love just the diversification of the receiver room. Which, you know, you're watching practice in the summer and you're seeing Devontae Smith and then Quez Watkins out there and Greg Ward and John Hightower and back-to-back-to-back reps. Just nice getting some diversification. We added Zach Paschal in free agency, clearly a thick, good blocking receiver, guy that's really tough. And then adding a 225-pound receiver in Traylon Burks. Different skill sets, different sizes, shapes. That's all part of the melting pot for Nick Sirianni and having weapons at Jalen Hurts' disposal. So I think I love seeing the different shapes and sizes. I think it'll be almost funny to see the 175-pound Devontae Smith and then 225 Traylon Burks, one, two, in the order of receiver drills out there. But that's the name of the game. Have weapons, have different skill sets at weapons, and keep adding young talent to the offense. I think the Eagles are on a great track to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly uh, when you look at Traylon Burks, uh, one of the more impressive players uh, in this class. Now, uh, real quickly, I'm just going to run through a couple of categories here. Uh, Most notable nugget for me in the top part of this draft. And again, I just love getting these insights uh, from writers all around the NFL that are in tune with each of these teams. Uh, Jeff Zrebeck uh, on the Baltimore Ravens taking pass rusher Jermaine Johnson from Florida State. Uh, Jeff brought up the fact that pass when they look at pass rushers out in Baltimore, Odafe Owe last year from Penn State, he was the exception. The Ravens typically put a lot of emphasis on production when it comes to evaluating college pass rushers. And he also alluded to the fact that uh, the senior bowl is a huge, huge impact uh, with uh, the Baltimore front office. And there are people in that building uh, that really put a lot of value uh, on that game, the way that players produce uh, with the the top players in the country all on that stage down in Mobile, Alabama. So I thought that was an interesting nugget there uh, from Jeff. Biggest surprise in the top 15, Malik Willis at number six to the Carolina Panthers, especially uh, Malik Willis, a guy that a lot of people feel will need to be, uh, you know, you'll need to be a little bit patient. So for a team that might have to play a quarterback right away, is he the right fit? I think that's kind of an interesting discussion there. Uh, another pick that really stood out to me, Drake London at number 11 to Washington, Ben. Uh, and the reason why uh, it kind of brought me back to, all right, well, Marty Herney, uh, who's in that front office, Ron Rivera, obviously the head coach, they were in Carolina when the Panthers took two huge towering wide receivers in Kelvin Benjamin and Devin Funches. Now, neither of those picks quite worked. So I don't know if that would say that would help Drake London in this case, or if that would hurt him. Uh, but uh, that did kind of make that connection. That light bulb kind of went off for me uh, when I saw that. And then the, my favorite match uh, in the back 15, back part uh, of this draft was Zion Johnson at number 21 to new England. And that pick was made uh, by Matthew Fairburn, who brought up the fact that, uh, you know, he checks a lot of boxes, Zion Johnson for the Patriots. Uh, they've taken guards in the first round in the past. So that's not something that they're afraid of. They took Logan Mankins uh, and just also talked about how he checks a lot of boxes for what they look for an offensive lineman. He's versatile. He's smart. Uh, he's uh, a two-time captain. And most importantly, he's a mauler. He can move people in the run game. I would also bring off the fact that uh, they've also had a lot of success drafting players from the senior bowl. Uh, and that's something Zion Johnson, he won practice player of the week uh, down there in Mobile. So uh, just a handful of selections that really stood up to me uh, or stood out to me, I should say. Uh, great stuff, uh, Ben. We will talk to you uh, next week. Like I said earlier, uh, me, you, and Dane, we are breaking down the quarterbacks next week right here on the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand. 
Now it's time to hear from you, the fans, in the Draft Mailbag. All right, let's now transition to our draft mailbag. And we've got two questions here. And again, the best way to hit us up is to go on an Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify, wherever you listen. Leave us a rating. Leave us a comment. If you've got a question, we will answer it here on an upcoming episode. First up, we're going to start with Trevor, uh, who left a five-star review over on our Apple Podcast page. Uh, saying, Here's a question here from Trevor. This year clearly was not a star-studded quarterback draft class like it was last year. The buzz surrounding this year's quarterback class has pretty much skyrocketed during the offseason, which makes sense after seeing combine numbers, free agency moves, pro days, and etc. My question is, how would past average quarterback prospects in a top-tier QB draft class make out in a class like this one? For example, Trace McSorley. Uh, I'm a Penn State grad. He was the first person that popped into my head. He started at Penn State uh, and when they were unranked and helped them become the number two team in the country at one point. Sure, he had talent like Saquon and Gesicki and a solid wide receiver room, but he was still a pivotal piece of the puzzle. Trace also had the fastest 40 time among the other quarterbacks that year. How would someone like McSorley or any average quarterback prospect make out in a QB draft class like this one, a class that isn't filled with stars but seems to be pretty solid? NFL team needs are definitely an important factor, but in terms of overall talent and skill, I'm curious to hear what you think. So, uh, Trevor, this is my take on it because I, I think everybody every year will say, oh, well, QBs get pushed up. Oh, this class stinks. The, the, the QBs are going to get pushed up. There is a little bit of that. You might see like, oh, well, this guy uh, might have been a, a high second round pick, but instead he's going to be a mid first round pick. Oh, he was a third round pick. Well, now he's going to be a second round pick. You might get a little bit of that depending on the position and depending on the year. I do think that guys are anchored to where they are going to go, right? So I, th- you know, I think when you look, I think a popular one that people point to for this draft class in particular, compared to last year, because of how talented last year's was, and for the first time ever, right? that, that's the other thing to remember. Last year was a historic year for quarterbacks. You had five go in the first round for the first time in modern history. You had QBs go one, two, three off the board. So last year was a little bit of an outlier, right? But If you go back and you look at Davis Mills, who was a high third-round pick, and I remember on draft weekend, on draft day, the end of day two, teams were scratching their head. There were people in the media everywhere scratching their head. What were the Texans thinking taking Davis Mills uh, on the third round? Right? Why? Why would they do that? Well, that doesn't make any sense. All this, that, and the other. Well. The Texans think they might have their quarterback moving forward, right? And so uh, now, a year later, everyone's like, oh, well, Davis Mills, he would have been the first quarterback off the board in this class. Now, I think that there's a little bit of recency bias with that, right? And it's, well, we know the outcome. We see what Davis Mills has become so far in his NFL career and what he could be moving forward. I think if you have the conversation of if Davis Mills had gone back to school at Stanford and then entered this draft, would he have been the first quarterback taken? You could have that argument. But you have to remember, uh, if Davis Mills was just magically the same Davis Mills that we saw last year that only had, I think, single-digit starts, right? It was right around 9, 10, 11 starts. Uh, He had the medical concerns, right? If he was in this class... I still think he probably would go in the sa- right around the same area. I don't think that he's magically uh, from a high third round pick to a mid first round pick. I don't think that's how this goes. That's me personally. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm naive. But I don't think that that's the way that this works. I don't think if you had dropped uh, Malik Willis or Kenny Pickett into last year's class that they all of a sudden, oh well, yeah, there, there's no chance that you know they would go uh, as high as they're going. Now, here's what I will say. So if Kenny Pickett goes, say, uh, 18th to the New Orleans Saints, right? So the, the Saints pick him at, at 18. I don't think that we would sit here a year ago and say, oh, well, Kenny Pickett, he definitely would have gone 18 last year uh, as the sixth quarterback off the board. I, I, that's probably unlikely, right? But if Kenny Pickett, again, the, this version of Kenny Pickett, not last year's version of Kenny Pickett, which was uh, was given fourth-round grades uh, by the NFL, uh, and that's why he went back to school. I think when you look at Kenny Pickett, this resume with the, the, the ACC MVP, uh, Offensive Player of the Year, and uh, leads the conference champs, if that Kenny Pickett was in last year's draft, my guess is he's going off the board in the top 50, 60 picks, relatively in the same area that he's going to go here in this one. He's going to get a little bit of a bump, but it's not going to be drastic. So uh, to me, that's kind of how I look at it. So to your example, Trace McSorley. Trace McSorley, I'm going to look it up real quick as I'm talking. Uh, he was a late day, t- day three pick. I'm pretty sure uh, that he was a sixth round pick by the Baltimore Ravens when he came out. He was. He was a sixth round pick in 2019. I don't think if you just drop him here into this class that he's all of a sudden a, a high third round pick or a second round pick. I don't think that that's personally how it works. I think when you look at uh, those guys, especially at those key positions, at QB, pass rush, offensive tackle, corner, receiver, when you get to those high value positions, those teams are anchored. Those players are anchored into certain areas of the draft. There might be a little bit of a bump, 
But teams are always looking for quarterbacks. Teams are always looking for pass rushers and for corners and for pass catchers. So while they might slide a little bit here and there, I don't think that there's going to be this draft. Oh, this guy fell all the way to the sixth round uh, because it was a deep quarterback draft. No, like I, if the, if this guy had that level of talent, some team would have found an excuse to take him earlier than they did, right? So that's just the way I look at it personally. Um, but you know, again, maybe I'm naive. But uh, again, that's just the way I kind of feel uh, about the position. And again, people are. Talking talking about this class and say like, oh, well, uh, you can drop anybody in this class. They would have been the first quarterback off the board. If you want to say that all of the quarterbacks that went in the first round last year, that they would have gone ahead of this group, I think they, that's probably fair. That's a fair thing I think you, you could say because a lot of people were really high on all five of those quarterbacks. But uh, to say that, oh, you could drop anybody in and they would have gone ahead of everybody here, I think that's probably stretching it uh, too far the other way. So, Trevor, great, great question. Thanks so much for hitting us up. Thanks so much for that five-star review. Let's go to the last one here. This one comes from Do Senate, who left a five-star review. Uh, just talking about the Georgia and Alabama title game. Fran, love the show. I need your help. After watching all the testing and seeing the Georgia players just crush the combine and workouts, I was wondering if we were going to look back at the 2022 NCAA title game as the most talent ever assembled on a collegiate field. Can you think of another game that has rivaled that one uh, between the current group of draft-eligible players like uh, Walker and Neal and Wyatt and right down the line, as well as the group who are still in their respective schools, so uh, Bryce Young and Will Anderson and Battle and Toa Toa. Uh, this game featured such an incredible amount of talent. I think back to some some of those Miami teams from the 80s and 90s, but just can't remember so many difference makers on both teams. Uh, would love your thoughts. Keep up the great work. So uh, do send it. It's a great, great question. And so I did a little bit of work. I just thought in my head, in recent memory, since I've been following college football and the draft, uh, I go back to the early 2000s when I first started writing about the draft. I think my first article, uh, my first, I think my first draft profile I think it actually was on D'Amico Ryans, which I believe was the 2005 draft, 2005 NFL draft. Uh, so, And I was paying attention to the draft for long before that, late 90s into the early 2000s. So, uh, you know, we're, we're talking now a couple decades that I've been following. And I think, who are, who are the best teams during that time? Well, you can go back to just a couple of years ago. Uh, really, when you go back to like Al Alabama LSU from recent years, and I think back, okay, well, uh, even just kind of doing quick searches, who were the best Alabama teams uh, going up against the best LSU teams? And you'd see like, you know, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, sometimes up to ten first round picks uh, on the field at one given time. I went back to 2004 USC. That's Matt Leinart, Reggie Bush, you know, Mike Williams, and uh, you know, that whole group, right? Those teams had a handful of first-round picks. Uh, I mentioned like 2009 Alabama, even going 2019 LSU, they were just loaded, right? Especially on offense, just loaded with talent. But then you go back and you alluded to those Miami teams. You go back to that 2001 Miami team. That squad had 17 first-round picks, 17 first-round picks, 20 guys that went in the top 55 on that roster in 2001, 17, and that's just Miami. So, uh, I, and again, I didn't go through. They played Nebraska uh, in the Rose Bowl to win the national title uh, that year. Um, you know, so and Nebraska didn't have a ton of NFL talent, but you can go to like uh, you know the Florida State game that year. They had a couple other teams, uh, a couple other games uh, against teams that had some quality competition. My guess is that that would be the one uh, that might have the most. But 17 first-round picks uh, on that roster, I mean, that's insane. And even, like, looking at Georgia uh, here this year, uh, they're going to have a, a bunch of guys go in the first round, obviously, right? Uh, upwards of uh, potentially, like, five, six guys go in the first round. Um, they're going to have a bunch of guys go off the board, period. They might set a record uh, in terms of how many guys get drafted from that school this year. Um, but 17 first-round picks is going to be a, that's going to be a tough one to top, and we'll see uh, if that game can do it. Obviously, like you mentioned, uh, you look at Bryce Young and Will Anderson. Uh, those guys look like they're going to be top 10 picks, potentially top three or top five picks uh, a year from now. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if they can touch 17 first-round picks on one roster, much less one game. Uh, do send it. Really appreciate the time. Appreciate the five-star review. Thanks so much to everybody here for your continued support of this podcast. We'll be back next week. Like I said, we're talking quarterbacks right here on the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand.